Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, this session is Top 5 Lessons User Testing in Gallery Interactives. I promise this will be more fun than that title. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of common assumptions that people make about their audience uh, and about technology and their attitudes and behaviors. So this presentation today is going to be unpacking some of these assumptions. This are, these are some examples of things that I hear a lot of the time. If I bring too much digital into my museum, I'm going to lose my older core audience. Digital means that we have infinite ability to present content, so we can just load up digital experiences with content. Teens want tons of social media. They want tons of interactivity. So not all of those things are true, <laughs> as we will dive into in a bit. So uh, my name is Samantha Diamond, and I'm the CEO of Culture Connect, which is a museum technology company. But today, what I'm going to talk to you about is our audience research practice. So we do design and development, but we also do audience research before we engage in a project, and then we do a lot of user testing along the way. Um, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about methodology. And one of my reasons for kind of going into a little bit of detail here is that my goal for this, one of my goals for this session is that you have some tactical takeaways for lessons learned, but also that you could maybe become a little mini researcher in your museum. So I have a challenge at the end about that. So this uh, first slide here about research methodology talks about our audience research practice. So we adapt a lot of this from traditional evaluation and audience research practices for non-technology things, and then we adapted it for technology things in museums. So one of the first things we like to do is stakeholder interviews, and this is museum stakeholders. We engage with curatorial team, exhibit design, visitor services, my favorite, uh, digital teams, and executives. And what's really interesting about these one-on-one -on -one in-depth conversations is you have no executive shadow, you don't have any of the strong personalities getting in the way. Um, so you can really understand what are the goals of the education team, what are the goals of the curatorial team. And so ultimately, the goal of the stakeholder interviews is not just information gathering for my organization, but also to help consensus build. Um, as everybody knows in this room, there's many stakeholders involved with digital projects. So this is a really excellent exercise to kind of have a third party provide that consensus building um, uh, perspective. And it can reduce a lot of anxiety. I, I've, I've just sort of noticed that a lot of times the conflict in, um, in meetings can sort of be a fear that my agenda as the education person or my agenda as the exhibit designer is not going to be heard and incorporated. So a lot of times my presentations are, look how these things are not in competition. Um, so moving away from the uh, sort of the, the, inter the senior staff, we also work with the docents. And I use that term kind of loosely. It's anybody that's part of the visitor services staff that uh, includes like your volunteers, your registration folks, and also your folks giving uh, tours. And so we do surveys, digital and paper, free response, multiple choice, things like that. Um, and we always ask a lot of follow-up questions to these folks. They are a gold mine because they're the only ones who interact with your visitors on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe outside of your, um, your education staff. So I highly encourage if you're going to do this kind of thing that you make a little room for engaging with these folks. Um, moving on to the visitor side of the audience research practice, we also do um, visitor surveys and interviews. We have quantitative questions we'll ask and qualitative questions. And if we're doing the uh, survey in the museum, we'll also always interview the subject afterwards. And frankly, that is where you get some of your best insights. Um, it's really good to uh, do that interview right after they've used one of your existing interactives or they've gone through an exhibit area. And just a quick tip when you are designing these questions to always ask the questions positively and negatively. So ask the question a couple of different times, a couple of different ways. And that's a great way to kind of check that you're not getting false positives, because uh, people want to be agreeable. <laughs> um, so another tip is even if you are getting qualitative responses from people, you can quantify them. There is a way to kind of group them and systematize and organize those responses. So you always want to be trying to move away from anecdotal insight into measurable insight. Um, another thing, and this is the thing that's related to the challenge I'm going to give you at the end, is the visitor observations. So this is sort of like mild stalking, but you stand in the gallery with a clipboard and try to look, blend in a little bit, and just sort of track 
an individual as they go through the exhibition or work with a specific interactive. And it's really important to focus because um, there's often a lot going on if you have a busy gallery. Um, I uh, would recommend focusing on a few key set behaviors. Um, so are they, uh, instead of how are they interacting with this exhibit or how are they interacting with this specific interactive, uh, uh, saying I'm gonna count the number of taps, I'm gonna measure the time that they're engaging. I'm gonna collect demographic information like uh, approximate age or um, are they in a group? Because that has a huge impact. Um, the research methodology we use around user testing, which is during the design and build process, is we do two things. We do prototype testing, which a lot of you are familiar with, and Miranda talked about. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of, I mentioned a couple of different tools here. Uh, so you, if your museum doesn't have a lot of resources, either time or financially, or you don't have an in-house digital team, you can literally use PowerPoint or Adobe to create an interactive prototype to test content and, and features and user interface. Um, another online free tool is Envision, and then you can also create like really sophisticated prototypes with Azure and things like that. Um, uh, one thing that I would just caution you against when you are doing prototype testing is to try to distinguish between uh, whether people are reacting to content, the user interface, or the features, and kind of go into the test deciding this is my priority. Um, so if you're testing content, you would have the same example, the same user interface, the same features in every example, and you're just changing the content. Uh, we also do some design workshops. This is, um, this is something that's starting to come into the museum world where you use desi design thinking methodologies and you gather focus groups and you kind of, this is very resource intensive, but it's, it can also be a very enriching um, outcome. So you're, you're, you're almost doing, uh, uh, you're the, I think the main takeaway from design workshops is you're really unpacking assumptions. You're really getting out of your own way and your assumptions and you're really understanding the assumptions of the people that would ideally be using what, whatever you're creating. Okay, so that's it on methodology. We're gonna get to the lessons in just a sec. Everything that you see uh, in the following slides is pulled from a pretty diverse set of studies. So I've kind of aggregated and synthesized and I've sanitized it so you can't tell which museum I'm talking about. So it's, it's regardless of what kind of museum you're coming from, these are kind of uni more universal takeaways. Um, yeah, so we art museum, history museums, educator studies on field trips, um, things like that. So the first lesson is about audience intentions. Um, the, um, this is probably familiar to some folks that your audiences are divided into these kind of three general categories of skimmers, swimmers, and divers. Um, so a skimmer is somebody who's kind of breezing through the galleries. That could be a tourist or somebody that just doesn't have a lot of time. Uh, maybe they're in a group. Um, swimmers are folks that will breeze through certain areas of the gallery and then they will hone in on uh, highlights that they want to see. So they might be coming in for a specific exhibition, but they don't go to the rest of the museum or they want to see the crown jewel of your collection, permanent collection, and then they keep going. Um, and your divers are those folks that read every wall plaque, <laughs> that look at every single object and really spend a lot of time. Um, so you want to, when you're designing your in-gallery interactives or your mobile guides, you want to think, who am I targeting? Who is this for? And it's okay to say, well, this is for swimmers and divers. This is not for the skimmers. And so when you're doing your user testing and you're doing your evaluation, you know that uh, you, you know, you're not necessarily overcounting the lack of engagement of your skimmers. There is another aspect to audience intentions which is the, the groups or the lack of groups that, and the age groups of people in the museum. So uh, based on our studies, this is kind of the bucketing that, that we've developed. So you have families with or without children above or below 13 years old. Nothing's perfect, but that's kind of a good cutoff. Couples or small groups, so groups under three, three or under, um, and the age group of uh, older and younger than 50, and individuals older and younger than 50. And so this is not necessarily just related to how they interact with technology, but it's more about their general intention. Um, so just a couple of quick takeaways. Uh, children, the reason I draw this distinction with children under 13 is they, the experience for the adult in that group uh, is really determined by the child at that point. So, and this is assuming we're not in a children's museum or a children's specific area of the museum. This is just for general exhibitions. 
Uh, so whether it's a baby or a six-year-old, the, the adult's attention is really has to be focused on the child's experience with that exhibit or interactive. Above 13, we find that there's a lot more independence, so the adult will have small bits of time to engage in something, and uh, will, but will also selectively want to have like a learning moment with their child, uh, so they'll, they'll do like facilitating behaviors. The other thing that I find really interesting is uh, groups and couples um, so as people start an exhibition, they're, they might be together, but as I'm sure you've all seen, people kind of go at their own pace. So those skimmers are at the end of the exhibit in two seconds, uh, and, the, uh, and the person, the, the diver, is uh, taking, um, st still in the first area of the exhibition um, 20 minutes later. So, you know, you're, if you have a group dynamic where they feel like they need to stay together, um, that's going to influence your diver. They're, they're not going to dive the way they normally would. So the only time that these really stay true to your personality or your intention as, a, as one of these is when you're alone, so when you're dealing with individuals. So when you're doing your user testing, really, really kind of pay attention to this aspect of things because it it's like one of those invisible um, influencers. Okay, second lesson is about age. So we've worked with a lot of clients who have this real fear, I mean, over and over again telling us that they are convinced that older, their older core population is going to be completely intimidated by the technology. They're gonna have, they have a negative attitude towards technology and that if they even approach it, they're going to be afraid of it or it's gonna freak them out. And it is just simply not the case, study after study after study that we've done, this is just not the case. It ha but what is different between younger populations is the way that they approach the technology. Um, so younger digital natives will jump right up to something and start tapping, and they're doing that like many of us do to kind of get their bearings and understand what, are, what is the navigation, what is the user interactivity, what are the boundaries of this thing, the mechanics. Older audiences, I'm making generalizations here, but older audiences are much more deliberate. Um, they approach, assess, decide, engage, and they repeat that cycle. If they decide to go another layer in, or listen to something, or watch a video, they're approaching that opportunity, assessing it, deciding, and engaging. Um, but in nowhere do we, do we find that, um, that age has anything to do with that uh, technology comfort level particularly with kiosk experiences. Three, uh, social, social engagement matters, sort of, to teens. We've done a bunch of studies um, specifically focused on teen audiences, and this is, of course, something that uh, we have to take a careful investigation of because there's a lot of interest or assumption about how to incorporate this into the experience. Um, so what, what we found is that, and I'm sure you've seen this as well, teenagers kind of want to break from having their nose in their phones when they're in the museum. Uh, they, uh, so if you're going to introduce something that's related to social, it needs to be meaningful, it needs to be easy, seamless, and, and overall worth it for them. Um, but rather than focus on social as a feature, I would encourage you to look at how teenagers or young people use use their app, so app behavior, UI norms, navigation norms, um, to influence how you design your mobile application. I'm gonna give you a, a couple of examples. So this, this chart over here is basically saying, if you're gonna look at social in, through two lenses, content creation and content consumption, based on uh, multiple surveys, this is what we found. Uh, frankly, they're not using Tumblr Pinterest or Vine, and Vine is actually, we found out last week, closing down. Um, they're mostly consumers on Facebook and Twitter. They do use it, but really, from a consumption standpoint, active, rabid consumers of YouTube videos, but not really creating. Uh, email still works. <laughs> People are still using it, maybe begrudgingly. Um, Instagram and, and Snapchat are sort of these rare examples of a lot of creation and consumption and really off the charts with, with Snapchat. So how do you incorporate this? Like what is an example of how you would take that, this information and incorporate it into your, your behavior? So one example is um, the snapshot of the phone over here. We developed a um, emoji response module for these uh, audio guides. So this is the language that teenagers are communicating in on Snapchat um, and, and, and many, many other messaging apps. Um, 
So this is the language they're used to communicating in. Let them speak in their own language as they are reacting to uh, the artwork or, or the content, the exhibit experience in your museum. All righty, just watching the time. Lesson four is about physicality. And I have five quick things that I just want to point out about what that means. Um, the, re the reason I want to point this out is that these physical things really have an impact on dwell time and engagement. So simple things like if you have an in-gallery uh, interactive, don't block the artwork, the object, or the installation. So this image in the upper left-hand corner is, this is at the Met in the American wing. Um, this is an excellent example of it not blocking the installation. Um, at the same time, you also want to make sure that it's aligned so that you can look down at the interactive and look up back to the artwork or installation or object. So you want to encourage this sort of neck exercise. Um, and I think that that does it very well. Uh, standing interactives, uh, like whether you're sitting or standing, also has uh, a huge impact. So standing interactives, based on what we've seen, have kind of a five minute upper limit for 90% of your users. Um, people are just on their feet, they're tired. Um, but as soon as you allow somebody to sit down and use that same interactive, you can increase that dwell time by two, three times. Um, the one thing, the one trade-off though, is that it's psychologically more of an investment. I'm sitting down and I'm gonna use this thing. So your conversion rate is gonna go down. You're gonna have fewer people using the interactive, but they're gonna use it um, for longer. Um, and then finally, consider the, uh, consider the atmosphere. So if you're gonna be including a lot of audio, I mean, I'm sure you think of these things as well, but really think of it beyond um, whether or not the hardware makes sense um, or whether or not you have, you have experience, this is how you've done it in the past. Really think, is this like a contemplative space? Is this a quiet space? Are, is, there a, is it very noisy? So if you do have sound or audio or video or something, um, are people even gonna be able to hear it if it's very, actually very noisy in there rather than being disruptive? Okay, and then finally, lesson five before the challenge is content is king. And here are three sort of ways to think about content in this way. So the first is layered storytelling. Walls of text are intimidating. Uh, you wanna present bite-sized layers of information. So you're kind of tip of the iceberg and then you're giving people the opportunity to dive another layer and another layer and another layer according to their own interests. Of course, there's a trade-off to that, which is each layer is an action. So kind of think of your visitors as having a piggy bank of of taps on the screen. And it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of a somewhat limited piggy bank. And maybe they have five taps in them if they're a skimmer and they've got 500 if they're a diver. But there, there's some sort of point in time in which they have exhausted their, their willingness to tap, as I say. Um, so every time you ask somebody to go down a layer, you're increasing your opportunity for abandonment. So you really want to strike this balance ideally through lots of user testing, uh, to see exactly how many layers and how much content you should present. Of course, all aligned with who your target, target audience is. Um, yeah. So the second thing is uh, multimodal learning. So we always ask in our visitor surveys and our visitor interviews how people like to learn. And reading is very popular because you have a lot of control. Um, but I think uh, we've heard a lot of uh, visitors say that one of the things they actually like about coming to a museum is that it is multimodal, that they have the ability to listen, to look, to read, to just experience, to watch uh, videos and things like that. So, um, so definitely keep doing that, but also understand that you're going to have some visitors who, are, who don't like to read, who only like to listen, and that's, that's actually not just an attitudinal preference, that's, that's literally like how they learn in the classroom. Um, I've had, I've had uh, people of all ages sort of talk to me about how they literally cannot retain information unless they hear it, and then the next visitor tell me the opposite. So anyone working in the education department will be very familiar with that. Um, I think digital interactives are a great way to kind of accommodate all of, all of these individuals, but kind of think about how you craft the content in terms of how you will serve all of those audiences. And then finally, right for the screen. Um, you can absolutely present highly academic, highly scholarly content in a way that is easy to read or easy to read on the on a screen rather than in an academic tone. 
Um, I, I really do not think these things are at odds. They just require uh, maybe translating some of the content that might come from the curatorial department. I think your education department is, is probably uh, a great resource for that. And then just some simple things, lots of paragraph breaks, get rid of those walls of text, avoid complex compound sentences. It's like these little things that actually make this big difference in how long and how deep people engage with your interactives. Okay, last. Um, I'm actually serious about this. I think this would be really cool if next week you just took an hour, like your lunch hour or right after lunch, and went into the gallery, went into a gallery or somewhere, and just picked a space, picked an interactive, and did one hour of observation. You don't need to set up anything too fancy, just pen, paper, clipboard, and track, Try the, ideally do this for 30 observations, track a group, track an individual. Um, if you it, pick, just to keep it manageable, pick three or four things that you are tracking. So um, you can create a little like chart and it's like this person was in a group of five, they yes or no engaged with the interactive, I timed them at two minutes, yes or no they discussed it with other people. Just keeping track of that over an hour is kind of a lot. Um, so if you did that, at the end of it, you will totally be able to quantify and summarize those findings, and I guarantee you will have some kind of insight or have some kind of assumption about that uh, interactive or about that gallery area that uh, will be confounded. So if you do do this, um, give me a call. I'd love to talk about it, and you can talk about it with me in a totally risk-free way. So if you do learn something that you know your uh, head of curatorial is going to disagree with, <laughs> we can, you can still have somebody that will listen to you about this. So um, that's all I have right now. Does anyone have questions about any of this? It's kind of a lot. All right. Yeah, I, so many things I agree with there. Yes, uh, the earlier the better. I also think there's these, I, I, I feel like there's a lot of false adversarial sort of perspectives. I don't really think that, so we were working with a um, history museum and uh, they have a lot of pride in their scholarship and the, there were several researchers and curators that were just terrified that this was gonna become um, some like edutainment silly thing that didn't reflect the institution's values. 
And so the way that we were able to address that is a lot of things you're saying. They were involved very early in the process. I think the stakeholder interviews, giving people a chance to just have a voice for five minutes without being shut down by somebody else or feeling like they have to really modify what they're saying um, in a large meeting setting, um, re really helped to make them feel heard. Um, I, you know, I think, um, yeah, I think, I think that a lot of that stuff really, in my experience, has helped um, manage some of those uh, perceptions. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, sure, so an interface might be something like where you're placing a button or where the navigation menu is or something like that. And a feature is something like, um, like GPS is a feature, just, just as an example. It's kind of like, I mean a feature can mean a lot of different things and obviously these things are related. Um, but if you're, let's say using the GPS example, let's say you had some kind of GPS map built in but nobody could find the button to get to the map, it doesn't mean that the GPS feature is bad, it means that the UI was bad. Yeah, no problem. Cool. Let's see what, we literally have one minute left. <laughs> 